Good evening, Mahaba. Welcome, I'm very pleased to be here with you this evening. And uh, it's almost a year since we planned our, we were to visit you in person and we're very sorry not to be there in Istanbul with you or elsewhere in Turkey and we hope you're all doing uh, very well. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity though and we're so pleased to have so many of you connecting with us uh, this evening. Um, as you are well aware, Imperial College London is the UK's most international university and we're very proud of our highly international staff, our students and our alumni. And our collaborations throughout the world make Imperial a powerhouse in research, education and innovation. So we're really pleased to be here with our wonderful community in Turkey and beyond to have this discussion with an outstanding panel of guests, including our own alumnus, Bulent Echevashi, chairman of Echevashi Holding. This evening, we will explore the evolving innovation system in Turkey, UK-Turkey business relations and opportunities for future collaboration. Now it's a great topic for Imperial in our panel tonight as we have very strong connections to Turkey. We routinely have over 80 students studying uh, at Imperial from Turkey and over 20 of our staff members are also from Turkey. And we have a very large and very talented alumni base around the world. We have important collaborations too. Over the past five years, we've co-authored uh, over 450 publications with Turkish partners in universities and research institutes. Imperial College is also the UK's most innovative university and routinely ranked second or third in Europe. We're forging new ground in fostering student entrepreneurship, developing incubators, hackathons, and scale up opportunities for fledgling businesses. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our panelists, our speakers tonight, so we can get on to our discussion of innovation. So first, my my co-host, uh, Bulent Bey. Uh, it's wonderful to <laughs> Thank be Thank you. Uh, after graduating uh, from Imperial, uh, Bulent studied chemistry at Imperial. And after he graduated in 1972, he took a Master of Science in Chemical Engineering at MIT. That makes us fellow chemical engineers, uh, Bulent. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, and he began working, of course, for the, the business at Jibashi Holding, founded by his father, Nejat Ejibashi. Today, this group's biggest brand is perhaps the very familiar to many, uh, Vitra A, which produces and exports uh, sanitary ware, bathroom furniture, brassware, and ceramic tiles, uh, and exports those to more than 80 countries. So a true uh, global leader, uh, Bullet's forward-looking recent book, A Rip in the Sea, New Responsibilities for Business, sets the stage for this entrepreneurial alumnus to help lead our discussion this evening. You also know that Bullet and his wife, Oya, have a personal passion in art and design. Oya is chair of the Istanbul Modern Art Foundation, which Bullet founded, and Bullet is the chairman of the Istanbul Foundation for Culture and Arts the Istanbul Art Biennale and its associated design Biennale. And we very much look forward to those events. We're joined uh, this, this evening by Dr. Firat Guder, uh, a senior lecturer in the Department of Bio Bioengineering at Imperial, working at the interface of material science, electronics, computing, chemistry, and biology, a true multidisciplinary person. He leads the Gouda Research Group, which focuses on the research and discovery of new materials, development of sensors, actuators, and their transformation into useful systems for use in healthcare, agriculture, and food sciences. Firat is an inventor of, and ha holds multiple patents, and he's co-founded four startups based on his research. So we will have a very good discussion about that. We have our other alumnus, uh, Humphrey, Hatton, who graduated from Imperial in 1984 with a degree in metallurgy and material science, and he's a partner of Deloitte in the UK. From 2016 to mid-2020, he was based in Istanbul as CEO of Deloitte Turkey. While in Turkey, he was a board member of the British Chamber of Commerce Turkey 
and he works uh, worked closely with the Department of International Trade to promote trade and investment activities between the two countries. Before moving to Turkey, he spent over five years in Dubai as CEO of Deloitte Corporate Finance for the Middle East. And during his studies in London, Humphrey was a keen rower and went on to compete for England in the Commonwealth Games in 1986. <clears throat> so it's wonderful to have you all here. And Bulat Bey, let's begin with your interesting story, which I think frames our, uh, our topic of innovation and uh, your entrepreneurial pathway uh, is a very inspiring one. So I wonder if you could share with us a few of your memories. Uh, how, how did you find yourself coming to Imperial and, uh, when you studied chemistry there uh, and lived in London? Uh, what were your experiences and how, how did that set you uh, off on the wonderful career you've had? Thank you, Professor Gass. Thank you very much for this introduction. It's a great pleasure to be with you at the Imperial community uh, through this online event. Um, well, the decision to study chemistry uh, and study chemistry at Imperial, um, first of all, it really did not have anything to do with our family business, uh, but it was because of my deep interest in physical sciences and maths. Um, how did I decide to study at Imperial College? The long and short of it is that my father decided it for me. I had uh, graduated from a German school. Uh, I was top of my class. I received a grant from the German government to study in Germany. Um, I was going to be independent of my family. I was looking forward to it. But my father said, no, no, enough German. You have to study in England, get to know a different culture. And also, you have to learn good English. The German school English is not good enough. So I applied to uh, Cambridge University and Imperial College to study chemistry. I got accepted. And I didn't know what to do because I was so hypnotized by the reputations of both universities. My father didn't have any doubts and made the decision right away. He said, higher education is not about getting a university diploma. You have to use your time to become a cultured person. And there's no better place for that than London, one of the greatest cultural centers of the world. You have to go to Imperial College. So that's what I did. If you allow me, President Guest, I'll insert a little advertisement for our chemistry department here especially for young students interested in following a course in chemistry, Imperial Please. College, Imperial College has, a, has a great tradition of excellence in teaching and research in, in chemistry, which goes back to mid 19th century, to the origins of Imperial College as the Royal College of Chemistry. Many important names who are well known to chemists were either students or professors at Imperial College like the famous uh, German professor, August Wilhelm Hoffmann, who was the first professor at the Royal College of Chemistry. Sir Edward Franklin, known as the father of uh, organometallic chemistry, and Sir William Perkin, father of the British dyestuffs industry. Of course, the important thing is not that the history of the department is glorious, but uh, that the tradition of excellence has been continued it is always ranked among the top chemistry schools in the world and with the top three or four in Europe with Oxford, Cambridge and ETH of Zurich. So uh, I think uh, my father made the right decision. So you, uh, you were studying at Imperial when uh, there was a Nobel Prize announced. Can you relate that day and how that might have been? Yes. <laughs> Uh, Professor Barton got the Nobel Prize uh, in chemistry for his work in uh, conformational analysis in uh, organic chemistry. Um, I cannot remember any celebrations when Professor Barton got his Nobel Prize. I cannot even remember any announcements. Uh, we just found out. Uh, maybe there was a cocktail reception given by the uh, organic chemistry department in one of their labs where people stood around in their white coats, sipping sherry. But uh, naturally, we poor undergraduates were not invited. 
Professor Barton gave his regular lectures and it was as if the Nobel Prize was something that was expected to happen as an ordinary event every year. But I remember uh, disappointing Professor Barton on one occasion. Our most important exams were at the end of the second year, covering the courses of the first two years. And in the third year, we were expected to specialize in one of the major branches of chemistry. I came first in organic chemistry in our second year exams, and I was awarded the Hoffman Prize. The Hoffman Prize was a book of my choice that I would purchase and the college would reimburse me for it. So I bought a book and took it, took it to Professor Barton, the chair of the organic department for him to sign as I was supposed to do. He stood up shook my hand, congratulated me, took the book and saw the title. It was uh, this book. It's Quantum Mechanics by Linus Pauling. He said, uh, he saw the book and said, aren't you going to join the organic chemistry department? I said, no, I want to do physical chemistry because I want to get my master's degree in chemical engineering. He said, well, all right, it's a pity, but I'll sign it anyway. So that's his signature. And the price of the book, two pounds 45. So this book is one of my most precious possessions. We must not forget to mention Professor Jeffrey Wilkinson, uh, chair of our inorganic chemistry department, who received the Nobel Prize for research in contexts of transition metals in 1973, the year after we graduated. He was a completely different character, always laughing and making jokes. His lectures were a lot of fun. He was also the author of the most famous textbook of advanced inorganic chemistry, which students all over the world had to read. Nobel Prize winners become famous, but uh, there were uh, many exceptional researchers in addition to Professor Barton and Professor Wilkinson in our department, and now I know uh, there still are. Indeed, and uh, while much has changed, I think much has remained uh, consistent. The rigorous education oh. and the inspiring staff uh, to interact with, and that's a that's a wonderfully inspiring story because you were in the midst of these Nobel laureates and uh, you were in these great uh, scientists, yet you also had your own direction. You know what you wanted to do. And, uh, and I'd like to think that physical chemists and chemical engineers can do anything. And you've certainly shown uh, <laughs> that you've been able to navigate. So perhaps turning a bit to how those experiences at Imperial help shape your early your professional mm. career then as you moved uh, after your uh, master's at MIT and you and yeah. moved uh, into the family business. I did not take any technical responsibilities when I entered the family business. Instead, I thought it was time for me to learn as much as I could and as fast as I could about business management and all the related subjects such as finance, economics, marketing, human resource management, and so on. Uh, but R&D and innovation were uh, big subjects on my mind because Turkish industry was entering a stage where competitiveness was becoming a life and death issue, as opposed to earlier times uh, when the Turkish economy was closed, uh, there was very little competition and all kinds of technology was imported mainly through license agreements and sometimes with uh, joint ventures. So uh, we were thinking about how to get innovation, technology de development and R&D started and begin differentiating ourselves, not through lower prices in international markets, but through uh, innovation as much as possible. In the initial stage of our efforts, we focused on uh, design. Uh, we were moderately successful. 
but it is design is not a sufficiently differentiating factor since everybody is trying to compete on design, especially in our business. Uh, developing new technologies in a very traditional business, uh, such as our bathroom business, is a more difficult but more promising route to achieving competitive advantages. And this task is still continuing today. Yes, that's very uh, similar in some ways to uh, higher education and how the university needs to retain those core principles and the core values and the great uh, strengths of our disciplines, but also branch out and move into new areas. And uh, I think that that's part of our innovation ethos. And I'd like to think that uh, Imperial has a particularly strong uh, culture in that regard. Um, I'm not sure uh, who uh, inspired you throughout your career. Um, clearly, your early your professors at Imperial were a big influence on you. Do you have others? Well, um, I must say my main sources, my professors at Imperial, certainly, I, uh, I remember uh, many of them, maybe all of them. Uh, but in uh, my life as a business uh, man, my sources of inspiration were mainly, again, my father and his generation of businessmen who were pioneers of the Turkish industry. Uh, what they had in common was a great optimism for the country's future and uh, the belief that the country's problems were solvable through good governance, immense admiration for what Kemal Atatürk had done, and total commitment to his ideas. The confidence which they derived from having established successful businesses under extremely difficult conditions of scarcity and poverty. A very strong sense of social responsibility and their belief that it was their responsibility to solve all the problems the country had. They were a handful of extremely talented, energetic and wise business leaders who founded not only great businesses, but also many key institutions of our civil society. Uh, I have tried to tell their the stories in, in my book that you mentioned, uh, A Rip in the Sea. I think that's a very important point and a very fascinating uh, thing that we we learn from um, these great people who who have passion and, and a commitment. Um, and that's probably one of the main themes for uh, entrepreneurs uh, that uh, it's that passion and commitment that makes such a difference. Um, I'd like to think Imperial is showing that same evolution as uh, and it's been wonderful to be back in touch with you um, as we've moved uh, from the strength of our 19th century roots in chemistry uh, through those Nobel laureates and other great people and developing new fields developing biochemistry in a very big way and now to uh, moving uh, to our new uh, and state-of-the-art fabulous uh, new building the molecular sciences hub uh, in our White City campus. And as we've told you, and, and we can't wait to show you physically, um, that community is, is really thriving in um, a collaborative way that brings new technology, robotics and automation and high level computing together um, to create new materials, to develop uh, new uh, frontiers for uh, chemistry and for chemistry applied to um, medicine, to agriculture, to material science and, and many things in the future. And so um, I, I, I really was inspired by um, your own uh, commitment and, and direction. And I think that that's something we can uh, learn from as we're forging new directions in the university. Thank you, Professor Guest. Uh, it's also a uh, wonderful for me to connect with you and your colleagues at the Imperial College after so many years. Uh, I still have some uh, classmates uh, with whom I communicate. Uh, very few, unfortunately, but I hope uh, 
through this event, I will uh, connect with uh, many others. Uh, and maybe we can do something also to um, um, uh, give a new uh, energy to the Turkish organiza uh, organization of uh, IC alumni. Um, yes. at, some, uh, at, at one time in the past, they were uh, extremely active. Um, uh, I'm not so sure at the moment, but uh, we, I think there is something we can do about that. Yes, I think that uh, it is a very strong community, very uh, intelligent and, and resourceful community, and we look forward to pulling them together. And I know that they will be eager to connect with you, uh, perhaps after this event. Yes. Um, and I do want to turn our, our discussion towards uh, innovation in Turkey today um, and uh, where you see it heading. But perhaps we should uh, talk to uh, Firat and Humphrey first and then pull it back uh, into that framework. And, and uh, uh, Firat, um, Firat's done some really marvelous work in, in so many different areas, as I mentioned, uh, a founder of four companies and, and many patents. Um, one thing that uh, Firat did, that I know he won't want to spend the whole time on today, but uh, it's been critical that our entire campus and, and many people have taken their years of fundamental research and pivoted to uh, working on uh, coronavirus uh, and co the COVID-19 pandemic. And Firat developed an extremely brilliant uh, PCR on a chip uh, device. And I might ask him to uh, tell us about briefly uh, as, as among our colleagues who have worked on detection, on epidemiology and, and modeling, on understanding the virus and understanding its mutations now, and um, all, obviously on vaccines and therapies and treatments. So Fira, could, could I just get you to indulge me a little bit and tell the community a bit about the COVID work and then want to turn to some of your other ideas. Um, hi, Alice, thank you. So we, I moved to Imperial approximately five years ago and um, you know, I had, so many ideas that I kind of wanted to explore. I noted over time that, you know, they were essentially gaps in technology where uh, um, we really needed these things, but they were not getting enough attention. And the, and the PCR work that, 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 we, that we, the PCR technology that we, we developed, it was one of these ideas that I noted that um, genetic detection technologies are very important, but they have been mainly limited to, to the laboratory setting. So, um, and, and we um, were lucky enough to receive some funding uh, um, from the Wellcome Trust, and then to start developing this idea where I tried to come up with a truly low cost and, and portable system uh, to um, detect infectious diseases. And, I tried to kind of pick, a, pick very tough constraints, uh, economic constraints mainly, and started working on this idea for the detection of disease in animals, because unlike human life, you know, uh, uh, there is a price for an animal. In fact, in Scotland, a sheep costs approximately 60 pounds. So, and then, so we tried to come up with truly low cost technologies. And uh, um, so we started working on this idea um, uh, roughly four years ago. And then the COVID pandemic happened and uh, we essentially just repurposed this technology for, for that. But again, as you mentioned, this is a, uh, uh, this is a small part of uh, uh, what we mainly do. My, my lab broadly focuses on the um, invention of new, class, new classes of low cost sensors to interface the world around us with, with machines. And we apply these the technologies developed in my uh, in my uh, lab to address some of the most um, pressing issues in in the world, uh, such as you know challenges in detection de detecting infectious uh, pathogens, or uh, reducing food waste, or uh, to to um, improve um, uh, environmental sustainability, especially in the in the in, in the agricultural sector where. Um, 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 environmental sustainability is a huge issue. So, um, but in addition to our, our research, 
and, and, and which we are obviously very passionate about. We would like to, as a group, we would like to see the ideas go from the basic prototypes. Uh, uh, essentially, we want to go from just playing around with things to, uh, uh, to systems and ideas that generate societal impact. And, uh, and obviously we do this through translational activities. So since I moved to Imperial, um, the training in innovation and entrepreneurship have been an integral part of the, the, uh, uh, um, the training that I, I give to my to members of my, my research team. So, um, and it, I have realized that this tradition, um, initially people come to the lab, they may not have so much of an idea or interest in doing this, but and then once you know, they get exposed to this culture, um, both in my lab and, and, and broadly at Imperial, they do realize that this is very exciting to take an idea and then turn it into something that can be used by others and, and, uh, and have an impact. So, um, and, and this has led to formation of uh, multiple startups uh, from my lab, including Black Bear, Unhinder, um, and Fruence Spirus. And, uh, um, and these companies are, um, of course, they're science-based companies. They require a lot of investment early on to develop the ideas into products. Uh, they still need to do their own research. Um, and interestingly, two of these companies are led by or co-led by uh, Turkish students, uh, which kind of shows that the, the culture of innovation is, is uh, in the blood of, 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 of uh, uh, Turkish people because we kind of get exposed to this from very early on. And, and given the opportunity, um, uh, uh, students can really um, flourish and take the ideas forward. And, and, um, and of course, I don't, I don't find this to be, to be very surprising. Uh, once the opportunity and, the su and support is there, um, the ideas can, can really flourish and the students can really start taking responsibility and, and, and lead these efforts. That's, that's fabulous, Pirat, and, and I think you're right. We have such incredibly uh, innovative um, students, and our, our Turkish students are very entrepreneurial, and it's exciting to see you succeeding with them and, and bringing that innovation and entrepreneurial spirit into their own studies. Um, it's also very exciting that many of your inventions or innovations are low cost, and, and thus such as the tests that will be available to low and middle income countries. And I imagine that uh, motivates certain students as well. And it'd be interesting to talk a bit about how you balance that low cost innovation with making a successful business out of it and a successful startup. Uh, I think um, historically, um, low cost has been thought of more poor quality. Um, but I think this is changing through smart, um, um, Smart engineering, for example, a good example for this is probably electronics. They are state-of-the-art systems, and and yet they cost nowadays, uh, um, you know, few few dollars to make uh, um, these very advanced systems. So um, I think the perception is is changed, and uh, what we really try to do is um, think uh, think in a way that perhaps people overlooked. And, and uh, uh, so how can we do this uh, um, in, a, in the simplest way possible uh, without sacrificing the, um, uh, uh, the performance of, of, of the ideas? And of course, this requires a lot of thinking, a lot of reading and uh, uh, a lot of failure. Um, but eventually uh, um, we do come up with ideas that, that we think may be successful but again, this is, the, this is part of innovation or entrepreneurship that not every idea will be successful and, and some ideas again will fail. And we're, we're definitely, you know, that's again, part of the training that my students get, which is that some ideas will fail. And um, it may not be even, even that the idea is bad. It's just the timing may be wrong or there might be other factors. Um, but, um, um, Again, it's just, just part of the training. And we try to come up with, with uh, um, uh, low cost and, and high performance systems. And we kind of try to see if, if uh, um, indeed 
they are as valuable as, as we thought we, uh, they would be. And we basically start doing our homework to, to translate them. That's great. I think uh, of, uh, great entrepreneurs learn from their failures and, and uh, build upon that uh, experience, don't they? Exactly. And again, I think when this happens to, to people, maybe the first time they kind of uh, uh, get surprised by this. But as an academic, you know, I fail all the time. And then they see that I fail and I continue on. And, and hopefully this is a bit contagious that they learn that, you know, when you fail, it's not the end, it's not the end of the world. Uh, and in fact, people that succeed are not the ones that didn't fail. These are the ones that kind of failed and still carried on. And, uh, uh, and I think that's, that's one of probably one of the advantages in getting exposed to entrepreneurship in an academic setting, because even if you fail, maybe there are some safety nets to, 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 to hold you and, 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 and kind of bring you back up. Uh, as opposed to probably doing this all on your own uh, um, uh, in, in, the, in the real world setting. So again, this is just part of the training uh, in, in the lab. Great. I think Bullet would like to ask you a question, if you may. Uh, yes, uh, very briefly, for, uh, may I ask you about your academic background and how, how did you come to Imperial College and uh, how, what inspired you to uh, work in this particular area? Um, so I, um, my first degree was in computer engineering. So I started mm -hmm. as a, a computer engineer, um, um, and so I, I did my first degree in in uh, at, the, at at the University of New Brunswick in Canada. And then I decided to basically I started asking myself questions. Electronics, they are fantastic. Um, you know, software, amazing. You know, we can do really interesting things. But and then um, um, how do these things work? I kind of wanted to understand how these things really work at a, at a, a fundamentally uh, a lower lower level and that's le that le that question led me to do a master's degree in germany in microsystems engineering which was a materials oriented uh, uh, degree and then i realized that okay this was this was great but i need to learn more more chemistry so um, i joined a lab again in germany to do research uh, for my phd in in, in nanomaterials and then once I uh, did, finished that degree, I said, okay, um, uh, you know, going forward, where are the biggest questions, unanswered questions in the world right now? And to me, the answer to that was probably biology, biology or biological systems. So I deci decided to pivot towards uh, more biological research. And, and I was lucky enough to get a fellowship from the German, German Research Foundation to to work with uh, one of the pioneers in, 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 in chemistry, uh, George Whitesides at Harvard University. So, and that allowed me to get exposed to, to more chemistry, more, more biological chemistry or biochemistry and biology. And, and, uh, and I was able to combine all the elements of my education and my, my research experience to pursue some of the ideas that I developed uh, over the years. Uh, here, uh, here at Imperial with my own with my own lab. Great, thank you. Yeah, it was an evolution, basically. So, you know, just spotting opportunities Wonderful. here and there, asking questions and so on. So Wonderful. we have Wonderful. we have these two examples of many uh, very entrepreneurial, uh, creative uh, Turkish uh, alums from Imperial and and Humphrey. You spent a good deal of time in Turkey. I wonder if you. Um, experience that same uh, culture and do you find, um, how do you find Turkey's uh, uh, community um, and this idea of a more entrepreneurial work or more startups perhaps uh, developing in Turkey? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Alison. Hello, everyone. Yeah, so I can add to that. I mean, I was very lucky to spend three and a half years in Istanbul, um, leaving, you know, around April this year. Um, and I'm speaking more from an Istanbul perspective than a whole of Turkey, but I mean, much of this does apply to Turkey. One of the things, if you spend that time there, you cannot fail to notice that there is a strong entrepreneurial culture. Uh, particularly in Istanbul, if you think about it, it's a city twice the size of London. And so rather than having a small river in the middle, it's got a very large piece of water, but it, it, it's basically two Londons joined together in terms of scale. And then if you look at the demographics of that city and the particularly like the population from 20 to 35, you know, it's vastly bigger than London. Many of these people are tertiary educated. Many of the people are entrepreneurial and, and 
and perhaps are more perhaps more risk happy to take risks i would i would say than than what we see sometimes here in the uk so we had a lot of people who joined us at deloitte there you know who had often spent two or three years starting up a business um you know with some success and then decided to do something different but that's not the usual experience i would say in the uk so much so there is a strong entrepreneurial entrepreneurial background and there are a lot of events held you know in istanbul where people come together and you meet people who are developing new things often they're still students sometimes they're recently ex students sometimes they're doing uh, doctorates etc and they're looking for funding and they're looking for the kind of business support to take their idea to the next level they're looking for contacts um because many of these people perhaps are not are not well connected throughout europe and you know don't know who should i speak to in the uk if i want to if i want to develop this or who should i speak to in the netherlands or germany etc so there's a lot of support that these people can be given i and i think actually my my perception being there was was the the kind of entrepreneurial spirit i think in particularly in istanbul where i experienced it strongly was stronger than i've experienced anywhere else and i've been in many you know worked in many cities around the world um the government has traditionally provided quite a lot of r&d support through techno parks which give people you know tax, businesses tax advantages and etc um there's still a lot more to be done i i guess i one of the things i found was that perhaps there wasn't the close link between universities and business generally that is a you know a hallmark of of successful um innovation countries and also a, a success of trying to break down the barriers between business um and universities which of course is a great feature of the US some of the big US universities but also of course is <laughs> perhaps what at un imperial college is most famous for of all is being quite, kind of quite market entrepreneurial and I, i remember when i was at imperial in 1984 we were always very impressed as students that one of our uh, lecturers drove a porsche because he was also a consultant to a large aluminium company and he kept taking samples of aluminium out of his car <laughs> and analyzing them in the lab which was very impressive but that was the sort of experience that you perhaps wouldn't get elsewhere so much so yes and that i i think um that relationship between universities and the business sector is very important and and you mentioned government support as well um a question came in from an audience member it's very much along the lines where of my next question um and they say if we think of turkey as a business environment what are the most powerful resources and capabilities for innovation in turkey i would also you know what are the opportunities and what are the challenges and perhaps bulan you could pick that up and back to humphrey and and firat from all of your perspectives uh, yes well when we look at the uh, level of innovation in turkey i don't think um we are where we should be um and i do hope that this entrepreneurial spirit that our speakers have mentioned uh will sooner or later also uh vitalize the uh, innovation um environment and uh, industry will become more innovative um it is true that we have a long way to go um according to global innovation index turkey ranks at the 51st place among nations uh and turkey has been going back turkey's rank was 42nd in 2016 uh so while the resources we are investing in innovation have been steadily increasing over the years the returns are not rising at the same rate so it seems we are not managing these resources effectively and uh, productively uh, this is also the case for many developing countries among uh, the middle income countries i think uh, 37 middle income countries were listed in the index uh, that i mentioned turkey's rank was 8th uh, place uh, turkey has certain advantages but also certain weaknesses in innovation um now where will the uh, resources and the impetus uh, come from for innovation 
of course i can i have to look at this first of all from the angle of um, private companies and the private sector um, a big problem is um, attracting young talents to uh, our enterprises and to turkey in the first place the ones who are uh, studying abroad and doing research abroad um, we need their um, their expertise, their knowledge, their know-how uh, to get innovation going in, in Turkey. But of course, it is our task to create the conditions to attract them to, to Turkey. These young people can be successful anywhere in the world. Uh, they have infinite possibilities available to them. They can live and work uh, anywhere they want. Um, but most of them want to return to their home countries. Uh, the only reason they do not return is because they do not find attractive employment opportunities. They are not sufficiently challenged professionally, and they're not sure that their talents and, and their professional expertise will be appreciated, needed even, and rewarded. So if we want to give them incentives to come back, I think we have to, basically we have to run our companies well, make them competitive on a world scale, show young people that we are not dependent on the state of the Turkish economy. We are immune to the ups and downs of our economy. We do not earn our money by playing political games. We seriously want to invest in innovation uh, we value creativeness and creative people very highly. We are constantly in search of new ideas. There is diversity in our workforce. There are opportunities for working abroad. The compensation we provide is in line with international standards. And we believe in developing our people and giving them opportunities to grow. Uh, I think uh, we have to make sure that uh, we are uh, pursuing these policies and we have to communicate them well, of course. And finally, uh, we, ha we have to contribute whatever we can for building a creative, competitive ecosystem in our country uh, and our city. Creative young people want to live in environments where creativity flourishes through intellectual freedom uh, where the establishment of innovative industries is encouraged and where there is a lively culture and art scene and communities of, uh, uh, of like-minded people. So the task is not, not easy, but we have to do all these things. That's a fabulous uh, call to action, uh, Buland, and I think hope everyone on the uh, on this call uh, heeds it because I think there are things that can be done. And, and as we come out of the pandemic and have learned to use technology in absolutely new ways, I think that freedom to uh, work uh, from where you want to be and uh, to change the uh, nature of, uh, of your interactions across uh, borders is really very powerful too. Um, and, and your cultural uh, you're, you're contributing so much to that uh, that art scene and the creative, the rise of the creative class and the, the way people will want to be uh, in, uh, in a, such a wonderful place. Uh, it's really inspiring. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. Humphrey, um, uh, Bullens talked about these um, these challenges and and what's your view? Because I think you've seen that corporate side and that investment and the trade side uh, with Turkey. Yeah, it's funny because as you go around the world, often when you get in these conversations with people, whether it's government people or, or business people, often people, you know, the, this, the standard question is, why can't we invent the next Google? <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, you go back and there's been, of course, huge amounts of research as to why such a disproportionate amount of this technology and so forth and innovation comes from the US. And there's some clearly established things like you need good infrastructure, you need strong institutions, strong regulators, strong political institutions. You need very well-developed um, education and human capital. And you know, you need sophisticated markets and, and business sophistication as well. 
And, and if you have all that in place, then you can start attracting some entrepreneurs and some innovation. And of course, eventually success breeds success. You know, if you ask so many of the people I used to speak to at, at some of these um, entrepreneurial shows, et cetera, where they were demonstrating some of their ideas or some of their new apps that they've come up with, you know, they all wanted money and investment to either ideally to go to Silicon Valley <laughs> um, or perhaps potentially these days in, in some areas um, like, like green finance and so forth. Um, you know, London is starting to become a bit of a fintech hub. Uh, and obviously there are hubs in, well, in all, all through Europe, but, but inevitably, you know, the reputation of those places, because it's not just that they have great scientific and technical um, qualifications in, in terms of very, some of the best universities in the world, but they're also surrounded by an infrastructure that's supportive of those people. Um, so, you know, I think you have to be realistic. It's small steps initially, and those will lead to bigger steps. You know, you're not going to snap your fingers and suddenly become a major innovation center. But I mean, government policy is important and we shouldn't forget that. It can't be left entirely to the market. And I think if government can focus on some areas where it really wants to support and it believes, for example, that you know, there, there is some uh, built-in advantage to the country being in that way, perhaps in terms of green energy or in, perhaps in terms of healthcare or whatever it is, um, that it capitalizes on that and then tries to attract um, at least grow strong innovators in those areas. I don't think it makes sense to try to take on everything and try to be an innovator across the board, but I think concentrated um, targeting in terms of providing financial support and general uh, surrounding sort of business support and infrastructure support is going to be important. I mean, just finally, I, I would say one of the, those conditions I mentioned earlier on was education. And clearly it's absolutely vital to maintain the high standing of universities to attract the very best people in the world. Um, and there is such a clear link between high, you know, the, the university rankings and innovation centers around the world that that shouldn't, shouldn't be forgotten. And sadly, I do know, I did come across a lot of people who had left Turkey because they didn't feel that their children were going to get the quality of education that they wanted. Um, and we're giving that as a reason for leaving. So I, once again, education is, is right up there at the top of the list, I think. Absolutely. And I think about um, that ability to keep a foothold. You know, I think of how DeepMind uh, stayed in London, even though it was being purchased by Alphabet and it's now a part of that family of companies. Um, thinking about how to have that environment where people want to stay and are able to work across borders, I think is an approach we have a number of questions in the chat about um, uh, oh, the biggest impediment to innovation um, and private sector and entrepreneurs we've been discussing and maybe turn to Firat as well. How can the Turkish education system evolve to increase their resources needed for research? And how can we develop university industry relations with Turkish universities and British universities and what we can do to give incentives to our students studying abroad to return home. And uh, so I'd be pleased to take up these. I think that, you know, we view our international partnerships as very important, um, both from the uh, aspect, the multicultural aspects, but also from the great science, because if you have an international group working on a problem, they look at problems from different perspectives and they bring different backgrounds to their work and you get great things out of it. I think Firat probably has a very international uh, group in his own uh, research group. Um, university industry relations, um, I, you know, any thoughts on that and, uh, and the Turkish education system? Um, can I say a few words on um, university uh, industry relations, uh, Professor Guest. Um, now, this is one of our weak points, uh, unfortunately, because simply the tradition is not there. Um, industry um, never wanted to cooperate with the universities. There was no need to. Uh, there was no real competition, you know, uh, before Turkey became an open market economy. And uh, the uh, same outlook was shared 
on the side of the academicians uh, when they looked at the industry, unwillingness and, uh, and inertia. Now, of course, there's a lot we can do, and there's a lot we can uh, learn from British universities and from the British experience in, in innovation in, in general, because Britain uh, highs, uh, ranks very high, uh, high in the uh, innovation rankings. I think uh, in the uh, charts that I mentioned, uh, Britain is uh, in fourth place. Um, the major difference uh, is that um, we do not have a, have a focused innovation strategy supported by the government. There is support from the government, but it is not uh, focused and therefore it is not effective. Um, Amfri mentioned the need for uh, government support and for the government to be involved. Certainly, uh, I agree, but it has to have a certain uh, direction which has to be linked also to the industrial strategy of the country. The industrial strategy and the innovation strategy should be linked. They should, uh, they should be connected. Otherwise, um, uh, the results are not satisfactory as we have been experiencing uh, because um, we have been investing a lot. Uh, there have been, uh, there's been a lot of government money being invested, but if you give incentives to everything, nothing is really encouraged. Uh, that has been the, our experience. Now, um, there are examples of um, cooperation uh, between Turkish institutions and uh, UK universities and Imperial College. By the way, perhaps I should mention here that Imperial College and our Bitra Innovation Center are about to sign an agreement uh, to carry out joint research on innovative solutions for ensuring public health in communal bathroom spaces. Uh, I hope this will work, uh, work and uh, this collaboration will become, we set an example for uh, other projects. There's an extremely interesting case I would like to bring to your attention here uh, as an example of a very successful cooperation with Imperial College. There's a nonprofit organization called uh, YGA, Young Guru Academy in Turkey. Its volunteers develop international projects to help solve the problems of their, uh, the problems they, their communities face. They founded a startup called WeWalk to develop the smartest cane, cane for visually impaired people. WeWalk is also headquartered in London and is building a very inspiring collaboration with Imperial College. The project is supported by the British Innovation Agency, Innovate UK. The WeWalk smart cane was also selected as one of the best inventions of um, 2019 by Time Magazine. Uh, the project is an excellent example of a startup which expands to uh, global markets from the UK. That's a great example, and, and thank you. And, and I'd like to turn to Firat, um, you know, on these, uh, these types of startups and what kind of incentives we might give to students to uh, return um, to their home country, return to Turkey and, and consider starting a company there. I think one of the um, um, issues I keep on hearing back is that um, there is a, there is a worry among, among among people that moved abroad and you know kind of established themselves here um, that if they go back they will not be able to uh, uh, they will not have the opportunity to come back out again. So, and I hear this quite often. So, um, which means that there is some sort of perhaps a, a, a diplomatic disconnect between Turkey and, and the, the either the Western countries or let's say broadly other, other countries in the world. So the, the channels are not really open to, to travel or, or uh, move between countries and etc. So people that live here uh, in, in the Western world, let's say, um, they just don't want to take the risk of going back and perhaps failing and not being able to come back again. And perhaps that's one of the uh, uh, problems that could be addressed. And again, that's uh, perhaps something that could be done by government slash governments 
to um, to catalyze uh, uh, knowledge transfer through uh, exchange of people and open the channels for for uh, um, uh, interacting uh, together. In terms of starting companies, I think uh, we kind of need to change the mindset, perhaps that um, that failing is okay, and uh, um, because most of the time nobody wants to fail. Uh, uh, perhaps sometimes it's there even like cultural uh, uh, prejudices against that. So uh, and 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 that can already start perhaps uh, earlier on uh, uh, during our education to talk about perhaps business and money and so on, which nobody talks about when we're trained in, in high school or, or middle school and so on. It's, it's very fundamental and yet nobody ever talks about it. So people are just taught mathematics uh, um, and not to uh, perhaps come up with ideas and, and do things with their ideas. And, and I feel like it's a, it's a mindset that could be implanted into, into people early on. Uh, and, and once it's there, then they will start thinking differently. And in, in terms of uh, thinking about problems, perhaps you know, they can start thinking about solutions to problems. Well, thank you, Farah. That's really uh, uh, inspiring. And about, uh, all of you are, are very inspiring. I think that uh, idea of, of, of failure leading to future successes is a very important uh, message. And I think you're right, there are cultural impediments. But uh, we've also heard some really great ideas on how we can uh, perhaps uh, enhance and improve the, uh, the innovation uh, ecosystem in Turkey, uh, the relations between UK and Turkey and UK universities and Turkish universities, as well as corporations across these borders. We advocate very much for, um, for uh, visas for entrepreneurs, for opportunities for people to move across borders. And I think that uh, our alumni can be very powerful force on this. So I think uh, along with uh, all of you, we will call on the alumni uh, with us today to think about how um, they can help, uh, help uh, our students, help our uh, collaborations and help our future entrepreneurs think about how to um, how to improve the entrepreneurial and innovative uh, atmosphere and culture in uh, in Turkey? Uh, Bula, would you like to? Uh, I, I'm I'm inspired and and optimistic after this conversation. There are a lot of challenges, but also good ideas. Absolutely, it was a wonderful uh, discussion. Um, I sincerely believe that the, the future of uh, any nation depends on. Uh, their skills and resources to innovate, uh, not only in science and technology, but also in any field related to the welfare of uh, of our planet. Um, so uh, <clears throat> the more we do for innovation, I think uh, the more effectively we will serve our companies, our communities, and our countries. Um, and uh, <clears throat> everybody who is trying to to solve the world's problems uh, it all depends on our success in innovation because now innovation has also become the driver of sustainability and now we have a cycle where uh, sustainability and innovation reinforce each other uh, and uh, i do think this is our greatest hope for the future well, thank you so much. And, and thanks to all of you. It's been a very interesting. Clearly, we could go on for two hours or more. <laughs> and I wish we were all together because we would have uh, have a little reception and more chance to talk. So um, I just want to thank our, our uh, wonderful group, uh, uh, Firat Humphrey and, and Bulan Bey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.